Hello dear ones, it's Alice. I'm here in Upper Marlboro, Maryland at the Upper Marlboro Elementary School site where I went to first grade and um, it's a vacant building now. It's used for some storage or maybe nothing. <laughs> and um, my uncle went here when it was the Upper Marlboro High School and before that it was the Marlboro Academy and when it was the Marlboro Academy there was a gentleman working here as a surgeon and teacher called William Beans and you may know him as uh, the, uh, the companion of Francis Scott Key on board I think on board a, um, a ship that viewed a bombing uh, by the British of an American stronghold and uh, during that time Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner okay so his friend uh, William Beans had had been um, well so there had been um, a war was on and there had been British in Upper Marlboro and the British had, soldiers had left but some of the British soldiers stayed behind to loot the homes there in Upper Marlboro. And William Beans took, he had slaves in his home and he armed them with guns and he himself was armed and they went to stop the looters. And because of that, be, um, there was a general, of a British general who later arrested uh, William Beans. And it was Francis Scott Key and a friend of his who went to try and uh, extricate William Beans from the British um, from the British prison imprisonment. Okay, so they were all on the boat because of that. And um, my grandmother, I remember my maternal grandmother when I was young, used to explain that William Beans was a distant relative of her family. And then after she explained it, she would play the Star Spangled Banner on the piano in the living room. It's kind of cool. And so I have a story for you today about, that happened just yesterday regarding William Beans. So get ready. Dr. Beans lived in a house just about where this house is located, uh, which is all to rack and ruins right now. It's right next to the what used to be the Marlboro Academy, which is also heading downhill and um, that house that he lived in was burned down later and I will show you that it's located right next to the schoolhouse pond which is kind of a cool place with a walkway all around it now I'm sure it looked really different in those days it had a pretty good view I think at that time of the schoolhouse pond with all of the waterfowl and uh, probably skating, ice skating in the winter time. And uh, right next to, on top of the little hill here, right next to all that, is actually the resting, final resting place of William Bean and his wife. Yesterday I had intention to go for a walk around Schoolhouse Pond. And um, before that I noticed this, this burial place and I thought I'd come up since I remembered my grandmother's story about um, Dr. Beans and so I found here on the left Dr. Beans um, tomb and next to it on the right his wife's tomb and I was just standing here because I, I have a practice when I come to old graveyards of, of checking around to make sure there are no um, there are no spirits there that are still waiting to, to walk into the light and find find their rest and so I came up the path next to the Marlboro Academy and I stood here for a minute saying a little prayer and what I noticed at that point was Dr. Bean's over Dr. Bean's um, tomb I noticed a movement of energies uh, and he woke up he was there resting there there were some uh, astral beings, I would term them like demons or devils, that were lying on top of him and preventing him from arising. 
And when I stopped by and said that prayer, um, they, they, they moved away from him and his spirit rose up. And um, so I talked to him as I always do when I, when I run into this, this kind of uh, delayed situation. He said he, he, didn't, he was confused. Um, and I should, I should explain. When, when the war was on, uh, Dr. Beans was a surgeon and he would go around to the battlefield uh, uh, trying to save the lives of the soldiers who had been wounded there and apparently that battlefield experience left him with a terrible post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I can only imagine that a gentle person who, um, whose life was teaching and healing uh, who was found himself in a situation of great destruction of life would be injured in his spirit by such sights. So um, that was my reconstruction of what happened because the first thing he said when he woke up was that he needed to stay in Upper Marlboro and um, and um, and make sure that everyone was safe there. So I realized at that point that there was an issue of war trauma and, um, and that that is often, some kind of trauma is often what keeps uh, folks from turning to the light and turning to their spirit guides after they pass on. It's like a mesmerization with a traumatic incident that makes it too hard for them to, to move on. And so it takes one of us, one of us, uh, who is awake and aware to to help break that trance and allow them to to move on you know what I mean all we have to do is just say say by the way did you know you passed on a while back and in fact your wife passed on as well and if you want it's it, you could turn around and greet your spirit guides and see what your options are right now you know so that's what I did and I I tried and yet he was still mulling over that terrible war trauma that he had had and so I referred him to the spirit world to his own spirit guides like this I said my own soul spirit to team my own spirit team right spirit to team I imagined and then team to team that's my own spirits should speak to his spirits who are still there waiting to help him or were at that time yesterday okay and then team to spirit his own team to his own spirit his own soul so it goes like this spirit to team team to team team to spirit and his own spirits greeted his own soul and helped him on and anyone can do this. Anyone can, can help those who are stuck on some kind of a sad memory or of, the, of the past. So eventually as I was walking around Schoolhouse Pond, I felt his spirit rising and leaving, turning to the light. It was, it was very nice. So I'm going to walk down there right now and I have one more story to tell you as I walk around the pond. It's about war. And so I found it a very interesting story and I hope you'll like it as well. So Anna. there is Dr. Beans's final resting place up there. And down here is the schoolhouse pond, which is pretty big these days. And you see there's a lot of fish in the pond. But right now it's mostly Canada geese. And a few mallard ducks. Big pond, huh? So, I have two stories to tell you about war. <clears throat> And they have to do with past incarnations of my own. So, um, 
I have more war stories, but I'll only tell two today. One was a time during the Christian Crusades, when the Christians were uh, seeking the Holy Grail and warring against the Saracen. And uh, I was a, a crusader at that time, a guy. <laughs> and I went off to war, and there was, a, there was just a moment that I remember from that war when I faced a, a Saracen person of about the same stature as, as myself in, in mortal combat, and he and I killed each other during that war. And I remember um, a recent insight I had about that. Um, my spirit guides told me that I was both people. I asked which, which was me because I remembered that, that uh, holographic audio-visual clip. I remembered the, the moment at which we had killed each other, but I couldn't tell which was which, which was I. And um, my spirit guide said that I was both of them. So this is an interesting thought that, that in fact when we war, we think we're warring against someone else, but in fact we're warring against ourselves and injuring or killing our own, our own spirit through war. And I had never thought of it until Spirit advised me of this. Now, here's the second story. It's a, it's a little longer and it's a little sadder. It's a story of the Revolutionary War. I'll tell you three. Okay. Long ago, long, long ago in the times when, which we would term barbaric, I was um, a, a warrior by trade. And I had a comrade in arms. And we would, we would go to war together and fight battles. And so far to the time I remembered, we had survived together. My friend had a wife. And for reasons I no longer remember, he found me one day in flagrante delicto with his wife. I begged his forgiveness, naturally. He was my only best friend. And he was so upset. He was so caught up in, in, in the passion of the moment that he killed me. He killed me with a short... Um, a short knife, and uh, the, from, from my point of view, there was a, a, a tremendous sense of incompletion, which is carried down to other contacts along those lines through other incarnations. I think uh, it's the warrior spirit. It's the it's the feeling of 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 killing our fellow man that causes us to to act so quickly and so um, so in error with regard to our own brotherhood for all humanity, you know? So that that's the second story. <laughs> you know, I've had many great incarnations, I'm sure, but the only ones I, I that come to me in this lifetime are those that need completing because there was so much suffering involved from that perspective. I'd like to tell the last story about war. I saw a kind of a mental movie. I, re I remembered something from the distant past during the Revolutionary War about a man who had a family and went to war and uh, his wife, there was a big battle and his wife came, sent her, sent her children to a friend, her children to a friend to take care of, and went to the battlefield and searched among the dead and dying for her husband to see if she could save him. And um, she found him there, walking. She didn't know he had a head wound and that he was 
delirious because of it. He had the doctors on the field had tried to to help him, but they were unable to, and they had broke. He had broken free, and he was roaming about, delirious. He saw his wife, and didn't know, didn't recognize her, and he killed her with his that little gun they had. He killed her. Then, as he lay dying. He shot himself, and his last thought that he had as he passed as he passed on in that battlefield was about how much he loved his wife and how much he wanted to be with her. And her last thought, as she lay dying, was what would become of her children. Terrible story. So. After seeing this, actually in vivid detail, this ter terrible story enacted, include, including what the people looked like and how the battlefield was and, and the concern about the children, I asked again, I said, which person was I in that situation? And guidance said, spirit said, you were both. So there you have stories, two stories that corroborate the notion that when we war, we war only against ourselves. And the trauma that we feel when we war, the, the, the terrible trauma of seeing ourselves injure fellow eternal souls in physical form, goes with us to the grave and must be cleared. Even if we reach a, a new incarnation, all that must be cleared from our beautiful being of light. For us to become, to remember once more the, the glorious, um, loving beings that we are. <laughs> well, so, so long from here, on that somber note. <laughs> See y'all later.